Institute's Chief Director of TV, Professor Norman Njeka. Each of our speakers will have 10 minutes for brief remarks, and in the interest of time, I'll introduce them as they speak. At the end of the presentations, there will be time for a few questions and answers. And if you have a question, please do turn on your video camera to ask that question. Of course, if you don't have enough bandwidth, then you can enter your question in the chat box. So we're ready to start our discussion. I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, Candice Sahoma from MSF. Candice is MSF Access Campaign Advocacy Advisor. She will speak on the pricing challenges to access pedacolin and will also unpack the agreement that J&J has for countries to access pedacolin through the Global Drug Facility and why that is not a win for South Africa. Candice, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maya. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so we have come together today to shed light on some of the challenges we encounter when it comes to accessing effective shorter regimen uh, for treating drug-resistant TB, as you have mentioned. Among these vital medications stands uh, bedaquiline, which is a life-saving drug that instills genuine hope for hundreds of thousands of individuals grappling with drug-resistant TB. Um, despite years of dedicated advocacy for access to this medication, we continue to observe a disheartening reality. But Aculin remains priced out of reach for so many South Africans. It's important to note that South Africa also played an important role in the drug's development, which later received the WHO's recommendations for its standard use in DRTB treatment through the work and evidence that was generated in South Africa as well as public money, which is taxpayer money, um, that was contributed and went into the development of this, um, of this drug. However, surprisingly, with all those contributions, South Africa is still procuring bedaculin at a cost twice, to, uh, twice as high as other high TB burden countries. As things stand, South Africa is pr um, acquiring um, bedaculin at 5,517 rand for a six-month regimen, while other nations secure it at half that price. So this disparity in pricing raises important questions that we must address. To begin with, um, let's discuss how Johnson & Johnson's ongoing profit-driven um, actions at the, expense, at the expense of saving lives. The National Department of Health um, engaged in negotiations with Johnson & Johnson for a new contract cycle a few months back, Interestingly, um, during the same period, Johnson & Johnson was also in negotiation with the Global Drug Facility. What should be noted is that while you know, Johnson & Johnson was, was well aware that the primary patent for vedaculin would expire in, um, in many jurisdictions on the 18th of July, just a month later, they decided to lower the price of vedaculin to the um, Global Drug Facility. However, they did not take any steps to reduce the, um, um, the price for South Africa allowing their pricing practices to continue unchecked. So the current contract agreement for 2023 to 2025 between the South African um, National Department of Health and Johnson & Johnson includes a clause that permits renegotiation. So we strongly urge um, Johnson & Johnson to go back to the negotiating table to reduce the price of bedaculin to align it to what they are offering the global drug facility, which is currently 2,465 rand for a six-month um, um, regimen. Another critical issue is um, which enables this price gouging by Johnson & Johnson is their patent monopoly. So Johnson & Johnson holds um, um, a patent um, monopoly in South Africa until 2027, so that um, uh, monopoly has been extended until then, which means that um, despite the availability of generics, um, this patent monopoly blocks other cheaper generics from supplying South Africa. So this basically weakens South Africa's position towards Johnson & Johnson. Civil society groups like the Fixer Patent Laws Coalition have been calling for South Africa to reform its patent laws. However, to date, none of that has happened. And this is also in light of South Africa... Oh, sorry. This is in light of South Africa calling for patent waivers globally during the COVID-19 pandemic, yet a very slug sluggish in fixing our own patent laws to enable improved access to affordable medicine. So we also st um, strongly urge Minister Patel, um, sitting with the Department of Trade and Industry, to expeditiously 
fix our patent laws to avoid being held at ransom by pharma companies like Johnson & Johnson, who milk South Africa's taxpayer money um, for their own um, for their own um, interest. So I'll leave it at that. Um, uh, but yeah, I think the the main thing here is to 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 highlight um, uh, Johnson and Johnson's uh, profiteering practices that still leave a lot of um, patients, um, DRTB patients, who you know could benefit strongly from 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 accessing Bedaculin. However, we are not able to even um, um, escalate or um, uh, um, uh, uh, improve um, the the numbers or in which people can get um, um, access to Bedaculin because of um, this price that is very high for South, for South Africa to procure. Thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks and that really great summary of the situation, Candice. We'll now hear remarks from Professor Norman Jaker, who is the Chief Director of TB Control and Management at the National Health Department. Professor, please go ahead. Prof, are you there? Professor Njeka? It looks like we have a small technical problem there and don't have Professor Njeka yet. Um, Candice, shall we move on to the next speaker so long? Yes, I think we can move to Philippa, please. Okay. So we're going to hear from Dr. Philippa Groom now. She's a medical doctor and she is currently the clinical head of department of the HAST unit, which is a unit that deals with HIV, AIDS, sexually transmitted infections and TB. And that is at the Nsaleni Community Health Center in KwaZulu-Natal. And Philippa will take us through the experience of treating I'm patients mute. with toxic medication. Yeah. I think we hear Dr. Professor okay. Njeka there. Okay. Okay. Professor Njeka, are you ready? Professor? Think... Okay, let's stick. I, I, I've just... been struggling to unmute. I'll mute now. It's okay. Okay. So, Philippa, yeah. just a pause there. We'll speak to you after um, Professor Njeka. Professor Njeka, Head of TB, Chief Director of TB at the Health Department, please go ahead. Yeah, th thank you so much, uh, colleague. I really struggled with technology now I'm able to speak. I have a few slides. I'm not sure. Can you show my slides, Candice? Uh, so I, I prepared a few slides to uh, talk about the use of pedaquilin in, in South Africa. Uh, it is right, Candice is it's really right that we've uh, contributed uh, a lot. Can you move to the next slide, please? Uh, we contributed a lot in the development of this uh, uh, antibacterial uh, agent. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, drug. As you can see here, it, it works very slowly. Uh, I got fascinated by this like 10 years ago when I got to learn about this drug, which really works very slow. Uh, I'd met the man who led the discovery of this drug in Belgium at some point, and they told me that uh, this is a drug that they wanted to discuss. As you can see, my own understanding at that stage was that this is an agent that depletes your bank account very slowly until you, you then find yourself with nothing. That's what it does to uh, deplete the life of uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, not very fast like isoniazide and other drugs we've had or rifampicin, but it's quite effective. Next slide, please. So you'll see that early um, research, can you move to the next slide? Uh, we, next please, we, we really evidence, but you'll see this first research on bridaquiline happened in South Africa. And the next one, if you click, uh, we're really inspired by the fact that we don't want, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so we've we've looked at this, and you write these are papers that uh, showed the work that was done, clinical trials 
done in South Africa, but also uh, other parts of the world. Next slide will, will show that uh, at some point, the program uh, went into uh, an agreement with local academics, and we started to include this drug in our uh, program, and we generated a lot of evidence that you can see here. Next slide. And in 2018, uh, we then uh, came up with, uh, uh, so this was just a summary of uh, introduction of bedaquiline and other, uh, you, you know, uh, interventions, because this really became an opportunity to improve on the interventions around drug-resistant tuberculosis, making everything all oral. So all this is in the public domain. But let's move to the next slide to begin to show what really happened. Uh, in 2018, we made a media release to say we're stopping uh, the use of injectables, we're moving with all oral agents. And next slide will show, subsequent to that, uh, there was a overwhelming response uh, globally. Uh, as you can see, our minister negotiated the uh, price reduction for the whole world for, for GDF. And the price reduction moved from 750 US dollar to 400 US dollar, which represented 5,000 400 uh, rent uh, in 2018. And, and minister was categorical as the chair, global chair of the Stop TB Partnership. Uh, he made sure uh, we do this. And this uh, helped us locally to save 36 million US dollar uh, by taking that move uh, to, to reduce the price. Prior to this, we're buying for uh, 9,900 for six months of production. Uh, I didn't want to say that uh, initially we received 200 free of charge, which helped us to, to do the access program. And we generated evidence that then scaled up until 2018, we removed the, the injectable agent. Can you move to the next slide, please? Uh, the next slide is just another, uh, you know, uh, there have been a lot of uh, communication around the world uh, about the intervention of, of uh, our minister by then to decrease the price. So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, this was not the first time. Minister had reduced the ARV prices and this one. And why was it possible? Because we have the numbers and we can really uh, convince other uh, people, manufacturers, to drop the price because of the burden of disease, but also the way we conduct ourselves uh, in, in terms of uh, using these interventions effectively. Next slide, please. So when what we noted is that uh, uh, Stop TV Partnership negotiated a feather cut with uh, uh, JNG. Uh, as you can see here, it's not very clear, but you find that JNG is promising now to sell uh, cheaper than the generic, which says it's $190 looping. Uh, this uh, looping is not registered in South Africa. If they register, we, we, they will be considered by our tender systems, uh, but they are not registered at this stage with SAPRA. Uh, but now, so what I'm trying to say is that in the past, uh, we had negotiated the GDF price, it was negotiated in South Africa. And if you go with the next slide, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, from the Department of Health, we looked at the catalog of the GDF, uh, and we noted that uh, Bidaquilin uh, is being sold 340 uh, US dollar to the rest of the world, which is 6,000 plus. We've been buying 5,400. So I'm not too sure uh, where's the evidence that we're buying more uh, because the GDF price was negotiated or administered in 2018. And we've been following this uh, with, with GDF 340. They bring it down to $130 or so, which is now, yes, now it is cheaper. Uh, so, but uh, we have not been buying more. We, we negotiated the, the global price, which is, but ours remained in rent, 
and, and the, rent uh, the dollar rent exchange rate put us at an advantage uh, because we didn't review. If we had to put it back to $400, you'll agree with me, uh, it will mean that uh, JNJ should have been selling to us already at 6000 something, but it, the price remained at 5400 So I thought this is an important fact which you can verify, which EDF you can verify with uh, our affordable medicines because I spoke to them yesterday. Unfortunately, they're not available to, to join here, but our tender documents are, are available. Uh, can we move to the next slide? The, the next tender that is not yet operational, this one, it is going to be effective 1st of October this year. Now, if you move to the next page, which is not very clear, the price has increased. The, the top item there is 5,500. It moved from 5,400 to 5,500. Now, this is not yet effective. It's going to be effective 1st of uh, October. Uh, so there is room for negotiation. Let's move to the conclusion. Uh, I would like to say that uh, in terms of uh, conclusion, uh, we've negotiated a price reduction. Uh, we are willing to negotiate again. Uh, we are not, we've not been spending more than the rest of the world, uh, but it's true that now, if uh, with the current uh, price that they are offering, uh, we will spend more from 1st of October. And uh, we've spoken to a competition uh, commission. They are uh, investigating this. Uh, I also spoke to the guys who deal with affordable medicine, the drugs in the department. They're working with competition commission. Uh, my request to them has been that uh, we need to ensure that we continue to enjoy a reasonable price a lower price, uh, we can buy more than the rest of the global community because we are the one who put this on the map. Uh, we are the one who are even pushing now. Uh, we we'll be the first program. We were the first program to go all oral with introduction of bidaquiline. We now started the six months regimen. People are again uh, in the next three months we'll make sure that all eligible patients in South Africa get the six months regimen for MDRTB so so bedaquiline is very useful and we're really moving uh, this um, agenda and, and it, it makes sense that our competition commission is now involved and uh, hopefully we will uh, uh, from the Department of Health this willingness to negotiate a, a better uh, price using uh, all available uh, channels in the country. That's why we support this initiative. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you very much for your um, explanations around the pricing and also for reconfirming the concerns around the future pricing of Pedaculin, Professor. Thanks very much for that clarification. We are going to return to Dr. Philippa Groom now, who is a medical doctor, as I previously mentioned, and the clinical head of department and also the head of the HAST, the HIV, AIDS, sexually transmitted and TB unit at the Nesselini Community Health Center at the KwaZulu-Natal Department of Health. And Philippa is going to take us through the experience as a doctor of treating patients with toxic medication and the benefits of using bedaquilin. Philippa, please go ahead. Thank you, Mia. Um, I'm just gonna turn my video off, if that's okay, just cause my Wi-Fi is a bit unstable. Okay, so um, just to give a background of, of, of my work in MSF and drug-resistant TB and how um, my experience with patients, particularly with an oral, oral regimen, where bedaquilin is the backbone um, of this treatment has been. Um, so in 2016, historically where MSF was working, all patients were referred to Catherine Booth Hospital, which is Central Hospital, District Hospital's drug-resistant TB. And children, patients with XDRTB and pregnant women were referred to King Denise Zulu Hospital. Um, and then in 2018, when we moved from the injectable regimen onto an oral regimen, 
it opened up a huge opportunity to decentralize treatment um, because of this all oral regimen, which meant that patients could access treatment much closer to home. And this in itself had a number of um, positive benefits um, with adherence, um, stigma, support, et cetera. And I will go into that um, just with giving a case detail. Um, so we were able to decentralize from Catherine Booth to Shawi District Hospital, another hospital, which meant patients could access um, treatment there. And in 2019, we decentralized again to Nguilazan Hospital. So um, this all oral regimen with Bedaquilin just meant that patients suddenly could receive treatment much closer to home than traveling all the way to Durban to a central hospital. Um, we further decentralized to a primary healthcare level and um, where patients are going to be started in this coming upcoming year will start being initiated, but at the moment they just decanted who are already on treatment. So you can see already that this oral regimen with bedaquilin has meant that access to care and treatment close to home has been significant. Um, in my experience, previously patients on injectable regimens um, where bedaquilin wasn't, um, wasn't available to us, um, there was significant morbidity and mortality. Um, patients who were required to stay for prolonged periods of time in hospital, meaning that they were missing out um, on working, on their employment opportunities, spending time with family. Um, this had a significant financial burden on these patients. Um, not only that, patients were um, the morbidity associated with it. There were renal impairments, often having to come back in because they were hypokalemic, um, but back from home because they were on these treatments, the injectable regimens. Um, and a lot of them suffered, as we know, hearing impairments. And the cost of having to, to conduct ongoing audiology um, assessments for these patients was another burden um, on our system. So it was significant to move from an injectable regimen to a bedaquilin regimen. Um, myself, having treated patients, I've seen um, how much of a difference it's made. So, for example, I had a young patient, an 18-year-old male, who in the previous two years had suffered with a significant extrapulmonary drug-resistant TB. He had a TB lymphadenitis, um, and because of that, he was put on a, a, an injectable regimen, and he re was required to spend a significant amount of time in hospital. It meant that he was away from school, um, he was stigmatized, he couldn't socialize with his peers, um, and he was not well, he was not thriving on this on this treatment. And we introduced a bedaquilin or oral regimen um, once it became available to us. And the change in his health was significant. He improved dramatically um, to the point where he was able to attend classes at school. Um, just his mental health, his mental well-being um, improved significantly. It was just um, like chalk and cheese. Um, and he has since done very well on his bedaquilin regimen, which he'd completed. Um, so just the difference in the sense that this, this bedaquilin treatment when or our regimen needs to be made available to patients um, in the sense that it means that patients can receive their treatment much closer to home. Um, it means that we are allowing them to not have to take considerable time of work to travel to uh, far places to receive treatment because the more um, uh, the more bedaquilin is available to us and to use in our oral regimens, the more we can provide this treatment much closer to home in facilities that are much closer to these patients. Um, and then that has a, a really good knock-on effect where patients are not having to um, spend as much time traveling, spending money on transport to get to um, these facilities. So that in itself has a significant um, positive effect on our patients. Um, yeah, so that in my... It's, that is mostly my experience. I think I'll wrap up there. Um, thank you so much, Mia. Thanks very much, Philippa, for sharing your experiences and also some stories of patients. We're now going to move on to Fatima Hassan, who is a human rights lawyer and a social justice activist and the founder of the Health Justice Initiative. Many of you will recall the crucial role that Fatima played in getting the government to make available HIV treatment for free in South Africa in 2004, and also more recently in getting the Health Department to reveal the contracts that they signed with drug companies for COVID vaccines, including a contract of Johnson & Johnson. Fatima will take us through the measures that we can use to make sure that medicines such as pedaquilin are available at affordable prices. 
She will also shed light on the bullying tactics that pharmaceutical companies so frequently use to tilt negotiations in their favor, as we've seen with the COVID vaccine contracts. Fatima, please go ahead. Thank you, Mia. So I think today is a historic day because the Competition Commission has informed the Health Justice Initiative last night, and just following on from the previous speaker's uh, comments, that our competition authorities in South Africa will be investigating Johnson & Johnson for its excessive pricing on bedacrylene uh, from the day when it first got its patent and made it available in South Africa. But it will also be investigated for what the Competition Commission believes is a violation of the Competition Act in relation to what's called exclusionary conduct. And that relates to the evergreening patenting practice of Johnson & Johnson that Candace has so eloquently described. This, we believe, is unprecedented. We, have, we do not know of any other investigation into a pharmaceutical company by the Competition Commission of South Africa for the evergreening practices uh, which are regarded as exclusionary conduct. We believe that Johnson & Johnson has been informed overnight that they are now under investigation. Uh, and obviously with MSF and many other TB activists and campaigners around the world, we will now make sure that we provide all the information to the competition authorities in South Africa so that this investigation can be thorough and can be completed expeditiously so that patients and people in South Africa are no longer prejudiced by both the pricing, exploitative pricing, I might add, conduct of Johnson & Johnson, as well as its evergreening practices and consequences. And this, Mia, you'll remember, comes uh, just days after what, what you've talked about, the scathing analysis of Johnson & Johnson in particular, of their COVID vaccine, very one-sided contract, which a multi-stakeholder group in civil society has reviewed and found, uh, which was only disclosed by a court of law because Johnson & Johnson insisted on the highest levels of secrecy and on non-disclosure. So a company that has not uh, really acted in, in the true spirit of transparency and accountability, we believe in both COVID and also now in, in relation to its management of the TB pandemic. Because that contract shows, uh, I'm sure you've read the analysis, it's available on the HAI website, a really one-sided approach to negotiating for scarce supplies in a pandemic. Um, and so the fact that this investigation follows quite shortly after that, I think is is, is really significant. And the, the allegations, if, if for those of you who are interested in the investigation, uh, because the competition commissioner uh, and kudos to her for initiating this investigation and this complaint relates to a reasonable suspicion. Uh, and so these are allegations at the moment and they have to be tested. But the reasonable suspicion is that Johnson & Johnson has violated Section 8 of the Competition Act in South Africa, which relates to excessive pricing or exploitative pricing. And, and uh, many of us now, you'll give Candace a chance to respond to uh, the prof's remarks around the pricing because we, we don't believe that that all of that is, is totally accurate and up to date. And then the second part of it relates to what's called exclusionary conduct in Section 8C, 1C of, of the Competition Act. Um, so I think that both of these uh, developments, the contracts that have been disclosed and the Competition Commission's uh, announcement overnight of the investigation into J&J, &J, obviously we believe it's, it's unprecedented, but I think it points to a different time now, Mia, in the way in which we deal with pharmaceutical power and, and, a, and a response to that type of bullying. It's not just on pricing, it's not just on patenting, it's also around allocation supplies, it's also around these so-called not-for-profit initiatives that are set up where the company has total control over which generics can supply it with versions, what the price will be, how the volume allocations will happen. And, and, and that is sort of you know part of the critique about why the GDF is not sufficient. And I might add, that no matter what happens with the GDF negotiations and the prices around there and who can come into that system, for those of you who don't know, GDF is a, you know administered by the Stop TV Partnership. And it's really important for many other countries. But for South Africa, we still can't procure through the GDF because of our local procurement laws, which requires government to go to open tender. Um, so it's really, I think, time that our regulatory authorities, and really, again, kudos to the Competition Commission for, for this investigation, 
Um, but also the department in our government and Candace has talked about the delays by DTIC on the Patent Amendment Bill to now stand up to the bullying, not just of Global North countries, but also the CEOs of these pharmaceutical companies. And that kind of bullying is, is, is taking place in multiple forms. So as we wait for our government to pass these very delayed patent reforms that would have allowed us to do what activists did in India, ironically, which was to reject and oppose the granting of a patent in South Africa of the secondary patent, which is what we call the evergreening. We don't have that opportunity because our law hasn't been changed, but we, we're going to use this investigation to show the world that evergreening and exploitative pricing are both anti-competitive and that companies like Johnson & Johnson should be penalized for that particular type of conduct and shouldn't be able to get away with it. And so today we wanna to say that at a minimum, after enjoying so much patent protection in South Africa because of our very permissive patent regime and laws, a uh, patent that j, j has enjoyed for, for 20 years and now seeking to enjoy it for even longer, that they should undertake at a minimum to drop all of its patents in South Africa and in any other low and middle income country and to enable true price competition and multiple generic entries. And, and really, I think to Johnson & Johnson, the world is now watching you. It really has to be a time of patience before profits. Thank you, Mia. Thanks very much, Fatima, and thank you for that breaking news of the Competition Commission investigation that um, will be launched into evergreening of patents of Johnson & Johnson and everything that relates to pricing of pedacolin. We're going to end with Russell Rainsberg, who is a health activist with a special focus on access to healthcare in rural communities. He's the director of the Rural Health Advocacy Project, and Russell will take us through the importance of scaling up all TB medicines and diagnostics to end TB, and also how we can achieve the health department the goals of the health department's TB recovery plan to end TB. Just before Russell starts, I would like to remind you to please, if you have questions, either enter them into the Q&A box on your Zoom screen or get ready to ask them after Russell's presentation by turning on your video screen and ask them verbally. Russell, please go ahead. Russell, you're on mute. If you could just unmute yourself. Yeah, no, I still haven't quite Thank figured you. out the unmuting bit. Hi, my name is Russell Rainsberg. I'm from the Rural Health Advocacy Project, I'm based at Bits University. And I'm greeting you today from the Rural Health Conference in the Eastern Cape, Tinsa, which is just outside East London. Uh, look, it's very difficult to follow the breaking news that Fatima has given us now. And, and we also like to thank her for the incredible work she's done in access to medicines and most recently ensuring that the secrecy around COVID contacts came into the public domain. But, and it's interesting that we start the conversation around patent reform and, and exclusive patents and evergreening and the like on the, on, on the eve of the transition from COVID. You know, we, the post COVID economic shocks compounded in South Africa, obviously by things like load shedding and, and unemployment, is placing years and years of progress in TB and other primary um, non-communicable diseases and maternal and child health and all the, the other diseases that fit within the broader function of the state at risk. You know, our economy is, as we know, there are significant budget cuts in the offing. And things like TB are particularly at risk because TB is primarily funded and delivered through South Africa's provincial health services, which are completely reliant on state funding. But let me pause for a moment and sort of just go back. You know, our country was founded on this idea of addressing the injustices of the past and creating a country that was based on human dig dignity and human rights and freedoms. But what does that mean? I think COVID in many ways showed us that we still have a very long way to go in dealing with inequality and the impact of inequality on people's access to healthcare, and none more so than in areas like HIV and TB, which tend to affect black and brown people disproportionately to the rest of the population. 
Now, Section 27 of the Constitution talks about, or any section of the Bill of Rights, places a, uh, like a responsibility on the state to take legislative or reasonable legislative and other measures to ensure the progressive realization of the right to health. Now, we can't do that without drugs. We can't do that without money and resources. And in many ways, for a disease that affects probably a multi-dimensionally poor people like TB and, and XDR-TB, for us to be paying twice the price is really a political favor, um, failure. And I think it's something that our legislators need to consider why we haven't fixed the patent laws to ensure that we don't expose ourselves to these kind of exploitative practices, not just from pharmaceutical companies who produce drugs, but also in the reagents and the testing kits that are needed to test for these treatable and preventable and curable diseases. So I think from our end, I think the, the, the immediate responsibility beyond just the competition commission investigation is also for the legislators to urgently put pay, fixing or patent reform back onto the agenda to ensure that as we enter probably the hardest financial crisis we've experienced as a, as a country over the next three to four years, that we can procure medicines at the best available price. I think secondly, an important component of the TB recovery plan is the rollout of not just targeted universal TB testing, which requires funding and testing kids, and we need to negotiate those at the best possible prices, but also the rollout of, of 3HP, which is preventative TB therapy. Again, something where we're reliant on the pharmaceutical companies to give us the, the, the best drugs at the best possible prices. But we can't do this in isolation, or we can't wait three or four years. We need urgent action. And I think part of an action is a clear commitment from the department and from parliament and the Ministry of Finance that as it considers these budget cuts, it needs to make ensure that frontline services for the delivery of the TB recovery plan, the continued um, implementation of the National Strategic Plan for HIV and AIDS, and that funding for those diseases are particularly protected as we figure out the way forward to creating a consolidated national health service that advances a better life for all. But we have one moment, and I think our failure to kick the scan further down the road will be something that history will judge us on. Because sadly, as much tension as COVID got, over the two years of the, of the COVID pandemic, more people died from TB than people who officially died from COVID. And I'll leave you with that. But I think this responsibility is not just on Johnson & Johnson to act in good faith, but for our legislators and our state bureaucrats to take forward this, the constitutional obligation to ensure that all reasonable legislative and other measures are taken to address these injustices. Thank you. Over. Thanks very much, Russell, and thanks for making the time to speak to us. If you would like to ask a question, because we're going to move on to the question and answer part of this webinar now, please do raise your hand if you would like to ask it verbally, so, if, so that our technical team can turn on your video if you would like to ask a question that way. While we wait for questions like that, in the meantime, there is a question in the Q&A box from Tiziana Massini, and she wants to know, is there any public announcement of the Competition Commission's investigation? Fatima, can you respond to that question, please? Thanks. Uh, you can hear me okay? So I yes, can't see yes you. you're clear. Um, thanks for the question. So this all happened overnight uh, and we have been informed. So you are entitled to confirm this with the competition authorities. But we as the Health Justice Initiative was informed late last night uh, because we've been asked to submit information as part of that investigation. Thank you. Thank you. Please stay there, Fatima, because there is another question for you from Anastasi Mokhobu, and they want to know, are you able to share more details on the case against Johnson & Johnson? For instance, any background information that may assist with context on the case for writing purposes? Documents, if you have documents, yeah, it will also great, be great if you can share it. Um, after the webinar, there is an email also, it's from Jacaranda FM in the Q&A. Do you have any more details that you can share for journalists, you know, who would like to write about this and have a bit of background? 
Okay, so um, I'll, I'll ask Candace to answer the questions on all the background information because I must stress that this inf investigation and all of the work around price reductions and negotiations and the GDF licensing is off the back of TB patients and TB activists and the phenomenal work that MSF Access Campaign has done, the Treatment uh, Action Group has done, and Partners in Health. There is a global campaign right now. We are not the only country who's concerned about the way in which Johnson & Johnson operates, both in terms of pricing and their evergreening patent. And it's really built off the phenomenal work that two TB survivor patients have done in India in rejecting the, the second pattern that was filed there. The case number, uh, I'm sorry that I can't seem to put this in the chat for everybody, is 2023 SEP for September 0019. The decision was taken on the 13th of September, that's yesterday. And, uh, and like I said, you can contact the Competition Commission as to the background that led to the uh, initiation of the investigation. But all of the materials, all of the information around pricing, around evergreening, around everything uh, about why bedequilin is so important, not just for South Africa, but, but for TB patients all across Africa and the rest of the world. And Russell is right. This, this goes to the heart of racism. It goes to the heart of an imperial-minded approach to determine uh, prices of, of a of a very important TB drug where South Africa is at the epicenter, not just of a TB uh, epidemic in the world, but XDRTB, DRTB, and also co-infection with HIV. So, you know, it's a really important issue for, for activists here, and this is why we're also passionate about it. But let me hand over to Candace about where people can find all the background materials. Thank you. Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, okay, sorry. Can I go? Yeah, we can just, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so um, as Fatima rightfully mentions that there's been a lot of work. We've been actually advocating for access to bedaquilin at a reduced uh, affordable price for many years now. So there's quite a lot of, you know, analysis that has been done um, over the years, which we can share with you. And we'll also just share some analysis um, recently done um, on the chat. But also, if you would like to get some more details or have any specific questions, please feel free to also reach out to our um, comms um, team. So there's an email that I'll also share, um, sipatimuloi at jobrek.msf.org. Um, I'll also share that on the chat um, for any further questions. Thank you. Thanks, Candice. I would also like to give Professor Njeka from the Health Department the uh, opportunity to respond to the announcement of this competition um, commission investigation. Prof? Professor Njeka, are you there? While we wait to see if Prof is there, Russell, would you like to respond to that investigation and how you think things are likely to play out? Russell, are you there? We seem to have a few technical problems, Russell. Yes, you there. Please I... give us your opinion. Yes. Okay, your okay thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, Norbert and Jake are here. I'm sorry, I'm struggling with technology. Uh, so, the, the issue around the uh, competition commission, what I can say is that uh, uh, we've been engaging uh, over the last month or so. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, correspondence that we've exchanged with um, the last. Uh, message we got from them was a detailed report uh, of um, uh, issues like uh, the, the price, you know, how much have we been buying from 2018, even prior to 2018 to date. Uh, they want to know how many patients have received uh, uh, bedaquiline uh, in South Africa over the, uh, the same period. Uh, so uh, we, 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 we got our data guys to be working and we will submit all this by next week. Although they've given us two weeks, uh, you'll agree with me that uh, uh, it's, it's a lot of work to involve a few people uh, in terms of getting uh, the finances, the data from patients. So in fact, a lot of materials are presented uh, Today, we also be presented to 
uh, to them. Um, so once we give them everything, and of course they're talking to various stakeholders in the country, once they get everything, then they will make uh, a, an official um, correspondence to JNGN, then they can begin everything before my yeah. end. Thank you. Very much, Prof. We appreciate your response. Russell, did you also want to say something about the um, Competition Commission investigation? Russell, if you are responding, you on mute. Are you are you there? Okay, while we wait for Russell, um, we there's a question um, from Kate Stigerman who asks, do we not also need to bring J&J &J to account for the recent concerning news that they are no longer going to be investing in infectious disease clinical trials in South Africa and other countries on the continent and globe? J&J seems to have changed priorities for want of a better phrase, Kate says. And she asks, what about TB and the drug trials that may have been publicly funded? Yet again, it seems they are putting profits over patients and people's lives. That is a comment and a question from Kate. Candice, can we get you to respond to that? And following that, Fatima. Yes, yes. Um, I'm sorry. Wrong button. Um, thanks so much, Kate, for that remark. And, and I think you rightfully mentioned that. I, I mean, it's quite, I mean, it's also not surprising um, that they are uh, um, disinvesting, I mean, investing um, on like um, diseases that affect low and middle income setting. I think it's part of the practice of, you know, wanting to profiteer um uh, on, 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 on diseases that maybe might bring them more money than, than, Ordinarily, um, a disease that affects low and middle income countries. It's not a, um, uh, you know, uh, it's it's not uncommon um, for them to do that. And I think even we've seen with 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 um, um, TB that it took them almost fifty years um, to to develop a new DRTB drug where you know patients were subjected to very toxic medicine, and that's because they don't. I, I mean, I think usually they wouldn't see it as a way of like getting high returns on that so it's not it's 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 part of wanting to get uh or rather uh to get more profits out of uh you know diseases that would make make them more money and i think you rightfully mentioned that you know we're not also holding them to account um based on the public funding and contributions that go into the development of these drugs. Um, I think also with the clinical trials, there's been a lot of clinical trials that were hosted um, in South Africa during COVID, even with pedacrylin. However, we're not seeing a return on, invest and on investment. And I think um, Russell also mentioned that it would be very important, even for South Africa, you know, for us to take a stand, you know, through our policy frameworks, through our, our law reforms, to create, um, you know, uh, um, um, policies that would have these conditions that would allow, you know, for benefit sharing. Because as it stands, we are contributing, but we're not getting any returns for all that, you know, the contributions that we that we are putting into um, into the development of these drugs. So I think it's also upon us as a country to to develop those frameworks to better position ourselves so we leverage. Um, um, on access when we host these clinical trials, when we host, um, you know, when we do um, contribute financially and in other means um, for in the development of these drugs. Thank you. Thanks, Candice. Fatima? Thank you. So, I mean, this is the part that infuriates us, right, Mia? Because We've done an analysis of at least, I think, 11 different clinical trials using pedacrylene. South Africa became the pedacrylene poster child of the world. But for the last, you know, better part of a decade, we've been scrambling to try and get more affordable pricing and trying to deal with the patent tactics of Johnson & Johnson. So there is a systemic issue, which is really concerning, that our government firstly allowed these trials to take place in our country, not just for TB, but also in COVID, without any conditions on post-trial equitable access and benefit sharing. We've counted at least 16 different universities and institutions that are publicly funded that actually administered and led these clinical trials. So we, once again, 
are asked as African countries to contribute to the generation of scientific knowledge, whether it was COVID, whether it was TB, whether it's HIV, and we give ethics approvals for these trials and they extract our participation, but we don't get any guarantees of timely access or affordable access. And so that's why the Competition Commission investigation is so critical and so important because what j, &J did here was made us the poster child of Badakwili for the world, but then went to our patent commissioner after enjoying exclusivity for 20 years and then asked for a second patent, which is what we call evergreening, on the salt formulation. And all of this is detailed in the MSF FAQs. And our government granted it because we have not passed the patent amendment laws that would have allowed us to do a proper substantive examination of that. So that, I think, is also the injustice that our government is enabling a patent regime and system for companies to take advantage of this. So companies are patent forum shopping. They come to our countries, they file their patents, but they don't have any requirements on when they have to introduce a particular health product into the system or at what price and for how long that price should uh, matter. So we can talk about various ministers who've negotiated price reductions, but what have they done to address the systemic injustices in the entire pharmaceutical health system. And I think that's important. Um, so if we are going to continue doing trials, whether it's on HIV, TB, cancer, on a whole range of other conditions, because our populations are being used because we have a large HIV population, we have large numbers of people with TB, they need to test these drugs on it, then something has to change. You can't only rely on, on our competition authorities to change conduct after it has happened. And so I'm really pleased and I'm really grateful to the Competition Commission, one authority that has finally stood up and said, we are going to investigate this practice of evergreening because our colleagues in, at IMAC, our colleagues uh, in many other organizations in the US have been warning us for years that a trick of the pharmaceutical industry is to evergreen, to try and extend monopolies for as long as possible. And we need to take, I think Russell is right, a deep look into ourselves to say, how did South Africa and the South African government allow the situation to come to this point? Thank you. Thanks, Fatima. Um, I see Russell has responded here in the chat box. He says he applauds the Competition Commission of South Africa on launching the investigation into J&J's anti-competitive behavior. But however, we need urgent action on reforming our patent laws by taking reasonable legislative measures to address injustice. We are now... Coming to the end of this webinar, but just quickly before we come to the end, there are two people who've raised their hands, and I would really just like to give them the opportunity to ask a question. Sabella Tau, would you ask, like to ask your question? And after that, Lynette Mboti, and then we are going to end. Sabella? Can our technical team help Sabella to put on his on their video, please? I see Lynette has written out her question. So while we're sorting out Tabella's ability to put on his um, their, their video, I'm going to read Lynette's question. For Russell and Fatima, why is the government so hard pressed to initiate the NHI program when there are systemic concerns at play? Russell provided a wonderful summary of these. The major concern is the dispute around the NHI fund, which is looking at a cost of 500 billion rands. Second, since we are price heavy in terms of commodities, how will the NHI improve access to health? So if you guys, Fatima and Russell, could just give a quick response with regards to access to drugs specifically, so that we don't talk about the NHI in general, as this conversation is specifically relating to access to TB drugs. Fatima and Russell, would you like to quickly respond to this? I think Russell's video is on. Russell? Hi. Would you like Hi. to respond to this? Russell, you're on mute. If you could just turn on your mic. I say, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, yes. Okay, excellent. Look, I think the NHI is not the panacea for all our issues. Right? But I think one of the does do is, and, and it's something that will probably have to be tested as we move forward, 
is it creates an office of medicine of, of, of procurement which will cover things like medicine procurement and potentially take them out of the kind of tender system so that we can probably negotiate the best prices for the medication that we need. But I think the main issue here, though, is, is not so much that the, the state needs reform. The current system doesn't work, you know, and we don't have consistent availability of services across the whole country. And that is from <laughs> the way that med, um, essential medicines are managed and distributed. And I think that has a direct impact on people's ability to be able to do the things that they need. Over the long run, the NHI may have this vision of a unified health system, but I think in the short term, the NHI actually presents an opportunity to address some of these challenges that we're facing with things like HIV medication, drug tests, and all kinds of other things by creating one legislative framework that we can collectively strengthen. But I also think that in taking forward the state's legislative responsibility that us in the social justice sector must find ways that we can strengthen the capacity of, 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 of commit, uh, portfolio committees of health to introduce the kind of legislation we need at the pace that we need it and not rely on the state to be writing policies on behalf of the legislators. And I think that's what's happening at the moment where the interests are so well um, inf infiltrated into the broader state that some of these things are delayed. But, yeah, we need urgent action now. And I think we, do, we wouldn't have had a better lesson than COVID. And if we don't act on it, then we are failing in our responsibilities as active citizens. Thank you. Over. Russell, Fatima, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask Sabela to ask his question now. He looked ready, looks ready, yes. And then we can get a response to that. Sabela? Thank you, Maya. I was about to say that, look, as a former executive of some of these multinationals, I, okay, I'm, I'm a former now at least, but I have noted that the, the issue of price gorging and overpricing, especially the African countries, South Africa being the most prominent one, is quite common across the board. And unfortunately, it would seem that we do not have sufficient forums to discuss this in such a manner that we can actually get to a point where the pricing is done right. Because it would seem that most governments do not know what are the input costs, so they just take the price as is. And we have this in the device industry where the devices are extremely expensive, but there's absolutely no need for that. So we are hoping that this will be the first investigation, but hopefully this will continue through um, a period of probably a decade or longer into other parts of the medical sector, including devices and other medication. And yes, indeed, it's a common practice. We know Johnson & Johnson has been doing this, but there's a whole host of other companies that are doing this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tabela. I'm going to ask Candice to respond to this comment and insight of Tabela, and then we're going to close after that. Yes, and yes, I think... Yes. Candice, you're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes clearly. Yes, thank you so much, Sibella, for, for, for that remark. I think you rightfully mentioned that it's not just Johnson & Johnson. Um, you know, there's a whole host of others and this, this, and unfortunately, I think it's it's also, you know, our system, our laws that allows for them to be able to go away, to, to, to do away with this. You know, there's just this ring fencing of our of our patent laws, of our systems in South Africa that allows for them to, to go away with it. So uh, I, I think one of the ways that which we can do with this, and I hopefully with the Competition Commission, I think it will really look at the systematic issues, you know, deal with things at a systematic level. So we don't have to go, you know, um, house to house or like company by company, um, you know, trying to fix how they, you know, their practices that I think the most um, important and crucial step is for us to fix this at a systematic level. And that would require us actually fixing our patent laws so that, you know, our patent laws um, uh, safeguard public health, ensure that access is at the center um, um, to ensure that people get, you know, um, uh, to ensure that, you know, lives are saved. So, but I do agree that this is a common practice. And, you know, um, I think also we've seen with the work that um, a health justice initiative has done um, during COVID and revealing, you know, um, 
through the contracts um, that you know Pfizer. Uh, you know, uh, CFAT, so we're currently running a campaign also um, targeting CFAT for their also excessive pricing for a gene expert uh, um, uh, cartridge um, for diagnosing um, TB. Um, so I think it's it's not just with medicine, it's also with devices. And, you know, hopefully this is also one of the steps or one of the critical moments that I think even with the step by the Competition Commission that we can deal with this at a systematic level. Um, because, yeah, it, it really needs to be dealt at that level. Thank you. Thanks, Candice. And that brings us to the end of our briefing today. Um, there is going to be a Q&A document that will be shared on the chat as we speak. Um, let me just see, is that there, Candice, already? And it will be a doc with um, common questions that you may have about the discussions today. Will you also be emailing this document, Candice? Yes, okay, so, so we, we will, will email, email we will email um the QA document as well as all the supporting documents um to our analysis. Uh we will be email emailing all of that immediately after this um this press briefing. Thank you. Thanks, Candice. And as you can see there in the chat box, the excuse my voice, the contact person to um arrange interviews with is a party Malloy from MSF, the media liaison person. And our email is also there in the chat box. That brings us to the end of today. Thank you very much to all the speakers for their time. And thank you, MSF, for organizing such an important briefing. If you would like to organize interviews, as I've mentioned, please do get in touch with Say Party. And if you have questions for the Health Justice Initiative or for Russell, can they also go through Say Party, Candice, or should they contact those organizations directly? So uh, I see Fatima has also put down their website for any further information, particularly the analysis analysis on the NA, um, on the NHI as well as their COVID nineteen contracts. But yeah, please do reach out to CPATI, and then we will um, um, share um, or make requests through through CPATI to the different organizations. Thank you very much. And I don't see the Q and A document here in the chat box yet. So should we wait for email? to receive that. Yes, please, please, uh, it will be sent via email. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, have a good day. And to the journalists, good luck on writing your stories. Bye. Thank you to Mia for excellent moderation. Yes, thank you, thank you into MSF. Candice, I'll call you now.